Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versus Stars Podcast. Oh, my loyal listeners, thank you for continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Chris Cantwell boards the mothership. He's the writer of Star Trek Defiant from IDW. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Cantwell. Thanks so much for coming to Traverse the Stars Podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Totally my pleasure. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for comics and who are your earliest influences? Oh, man. Uh, geez. I mean, I would probably say uh, I loved Spider-Man growing up, um, probably in the early 90s. Uh, this was around the time that uh, you could subscribe and they would mail you mm. the books. So during that subscription period, I think my mom uh, had gotten me uh, Spectacular Spider-Man and Captain America. So I read a ton of the the J.M. DeMattis uh, Sal Buscema run um, mm. on Spectacular. And I just love that. For me, that's the quintessential Spider-Man. And so I still think about coming home from school and going to our mailbox and getting out my comic books that had arrived from Marvel, which was fun. So are you buying anything now? And do you miss not having the mail to your house through the <laughs> subscription service? <laughs> it would be nice to have mail to my house. Uh, and yes, I am. I, I go to a store in uh, uh, Rancho Cucamonga, which is near where I, I live with my family. And uh, it's called Four Color Fantasies, uh, Four Color Fantasy. And it's it's run by a guy named Chris Brady. He's a wonderful guy. And I've got my poll list um, over there. So I'm reading right now. I'm reading. Gosh, I'm trying to keep up with everything. I'm, I've got Amazing Spider-Man on there, uh, Poison Ivy, Danger Street, uh, Void Rivals. Um, uh, the Hulk, the new uh, launch of the Hulk. Mm. Um, obviously, uh, Colin and uh, Jackson's uh, Trek book. Um, even because I don't like to wait for the comps if they send me them. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of other ones that I'm reading right now. There's a ton. Uh, I'm reading the well. It's just I think it's about to wrap up the Stan Sakai's Ninja Turtles. Oh, yes. crossover. I really love that. I love The Call by Kelly Thompson. I love Birds of Prey by Kelly Thompson. Um, these are all the writers, obviously. Um, <laughs> I'm just speaking to the stories. So some of the art in some of these is incredible, too. The Call art is amazing. Um, yeah, I feel like that that and more. But uh, those are the ones off the top of my head on my poll. Um, I'm excited for I'm excited for Coda coming back from Sai and uh, Matthias. Mm. Um and uh yeah there's so much stuff that's coming out that i'm really looking forward to i'm looking forward to transformers mm. um i think that'll be really interesting it's not necessarily a book i would pick up but these skyfall books are really interesting to me so <laughs> or not uh skybound books are super interesting so yeah i'm excited well, for that well i've been a, a long time transformers fan for a long time so i actually i'm gonna buy that as well i was buying them quite a bit when they were on idw um and you know, it's kind of fun when, when when you get rid of all the human element, you just focus on the transformers themselves. It's actually a lot more entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, and I I love. I mean, I, I at this point, it's like Daniel Daniel Warren Johnson is he's done some variant covers for Star Trek, and uh, he did he did a Day of Blood cover for us that's phenomenal. And and anything he does, I'm I'm picking up at this point. Anything that you know, it's the the usual list of of folks. Like I think uh, I think Skylar Patridge is an amazing artist. Anything she does, I'm picking up. Marco Finnegan is somebody I love. Um, I mean, there's just I could sit here and talk to you for a half hour and just list off <laughs> names of people that I think are just doing the best work I've seen. So now, yeah. now, now my memory correct, um, uh, Warren Johnson, he did um a series of Beta Ray Bill, correct? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. And he's right. I think he's writing and doing the art for Transformers, I believe. I well, think. at least he's keeping busy. <laughs> yes. He's a very busy guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's about your work. So you're currently the writer for Star Trek Defiant. And for listeners who may not know, Defiant's the name of the ship from Deep Space Nine, which is the very best Star Trek series that they've mm -hmm. ever done. I don't care what anyone says. Better than the original series. I'm going to stake my claim to that. It is the better series. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how do you get involved with the project? 
Uh, well, uh, you know, I think probably Jackson and Colin. So Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly would agree with you. They're huge Deep Space Nine fans. They're big Trek fans for across the uh, mm. across the spectrum. But I I came to those two guys um, and the artist Stephen Thompson uh, as a huge fan of uh, what they both what they all three of them did uh, for a book called Star Trek Year Five. Um, I'd been reading Star Trek comics, um, you know, since I was getting those those things in the mail, those books in the mail um, back when I was in fifth, sixth grade. Uh, I was just something I was always picking up. I was a huge Trek fan as well. So I was reading uh, those. And then I picked up year five because I thought it was a really intriguing premise. And I thought I thought that year five was one of the best Star Trek things I I'd, I'd experienced and not just outside the comic medium, just as itself. I thought it was a wonderful way to bridge the original series into the motion picture and it just the, the work was phenomenal and it was clearly by uh trek kind of aficionados in such a way that i, I was really kind of humbled and blown away by that so I, I think i started uh i connected with jackson over twitter or something like that just because i was doing my books at the time i was doing you know my original books with karen berger and had just started to to creep into marvel i did my dr doom series and uh, so I, I, you know, ended up talking to Jackson. He came out to where I live. I live way outside LA in a town called Claremont. Uh, it's a college town also with a big boarding school. And my wife is a teacher at that boarding school. So Jackson, I was impressed because Jackson made the 40 mile drive out to have dinner with me. So I was like, well, this is somebody I clearly want to uh, wow, value in my life. That's dedication most people, right Even my longtime 20 year friends won't make that drive. I went to college out here and they're like, I'm not coming up to Claremont. Um, so Jax came out, we spent like, you know, hours talking about stuff and uh, Star Trek among them, you know, they had just gotten their gig writing Captain America. I had done the bridge book from uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' run into theirs. I did mm -hmm. United States with Captain America. I obviously pitched on the main Captain America book. I didn't get it. I lost it to Jackson and Colin. So uh, <laughs> rightfully so. They're just kind of such fantastic writers and fantastic dudes. And they love Star Trek more than anything. And so out of nowhere, well, maybe like, I guess, more than a year and a half ago, they had put this thing together with Heather Antos, who had come over from Marvel to IDW, and she had been instrumental in building out that real canonical Star Wars comic universe where the books are interconnected, the stories are of import, and really lend themselves into the, the main storytelling of that universe. And she approached... Paramount um, and and with IDW and said we want to do something similar for the Trek comic books because the Trek comic books have been interesting here and there but they're little pockets and and mm. they were never really um, load bearing in any way to story uh, or larger pieces of the universe and so she turned to Jackson and Colin because Year Five had been so successful and they put together a pitch for a book that was just called Star Trek. Right. It was. And I think the working title when they put it together was Star Trek, no colon. Right. It was just Star Trek. And it really was like a fantasy football team of Star Trek characters that would feasibly coexist in this very specific time that they identified after Deep Space Nine. Right. So you've got people that are still in their prime. You've got characters from Next Generation that are still in their prime. You've got, uh, you know, some hangers on from the original series in the form of Scotty and Spock. You can have all these touch points uh, and tell one story, and and there is this this kind of blank period after Dominion War um, until uh, Nemesis, right? Star Trek Nemesis, the film from two thousand, and when everybody kind of comes back together and you see what they what they do. But like there were so many loose threads from Deep Space Nine that never really um, got tied up anywhere. I haven't mm. yet, right? And then you have Picard, where you get this kind of apotheosis, you know, third act to a lot of that Star Trek period, right? Um, with characters like Seven of Nine, right? And Tuvok and Picard himself and the, the crew of the Enterprise and everybody, Worf included. And so the what they what they put together was this pitch for this book, which was really what has become known as the flagship book of the series, which is just Star Trek. And, you know, I think Heather wanted a darker book and I would say darker, not in the terms of the way they did it with Star Wars, was a darker book that would splinter off from the main title. So, mm. you know, at Marvel, there was Star Wars. And the first book to splinter off of that main flagship title was Darth Vader. Right. And Heather was a big part of that. And so she went to Jackson Collin and said, what is this book's Darth Vader? And what broke off from that from their story was Star Trek Defiant. 
And they initially had the idea of Worf and Cisco having this anti antipathy, right? Like, which is building off of their relationship, which is very loaded in Deep Space Nine. Um, and having Worf leave that main book um, and go off on his own on a similar plot trajectory, but attacking it from a very different character mm. perspective. And so they came to me and said, what do you think about this? I think they wanted to write it themselves. And Heather was like, I'm not going to give you both books. <laughs> and so they came to me and uh, and yeah, I built it out. And I, I fleshed out their concept of Worf and Spock kind of going renegade and built out this book that really is, I pitched it as uh, the Dirty Dozen set in the Star Trek universe. I was like, no uniforms. I want a spectrum of characters, which is mercurial heroes all the way to outright villains who are there to serve a means to an end for Worf's mm. bigger agenda, right? Which in the initial arc of my book is to rescue his son, Alexander, because Alexander has joined up with the big bad of this whole storyline. So, so yeah, so Heather, Heather brought me on. I was really excited to do that. I built out the crew. We got Angel Anzueta to come on, uh, who came with me from Iron Man. We had finished up Iron Man the year before, and or we were actually still in the middle of finishing it up when we started working on this. And and yeah, we were off to the races. And then you know we 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 kind of laid the foundation, and then went right into building that crossover event, Day of Blood. That's you know the last issue is coming out on the twenty seventh of September, and so we were all in the room for that. We happened to all live in the LA area, so we got to writer's room that actual crossover event, and that was one of them. I've been doing TV for twelve years, and that was one of the most fun writers' rooms I've ever been. In. It was well, phenomenal. Well, so it was great. As as a comic book writer. And you're actually you're working into the flagship series. You had this big crossover. How hard is it to write your series, knowing you need to have an endpoint connecting to somebody else's story, running at their own stories and pace and everything of that nature? Well, I mean, Jackson and Colin and I are in constant communication, and obviously Heather is is kind of running the board on everything, right? And there's going to be still more series coming out of this new initiative. Um, and what was helpful about things like Picard season three and lower decks is that, you know, through Heather and also Jackson and Colin are close with Mike uh, from lower decks is that we could kind of, we had endpoints that we could aim for. We knew our trajectory. Mm. And so, you know, I talk about this with my sons um, who are 10 and six years old, but I've, we've gone through the original series now. I, uh, we did it during the pandemic and we're almost done with next generation my older one is very excited to start Deep Space Nine, but they're reading our Star Trek comic books and they understand it. Like, I was like, listen, hey, remember, you know, Ro Laren is really interesting character in Next Generation. And then she disappears in this very kind of intriguing way where she defects from Starfleet and joins a, a rebel group that, you know, the Federation considers terrorists. Well, in Picard season three, she's showing up and she's part of Starfleet again, right? So we we get to tell the second act of that story, which is the big meaty kind of middle of Roe's story, at least, right? Worf is different in terms of his structure, but Roe is very much like, here's the middle piece of that. And, mm. and lore, here's the middle piece of lore, because we know where lore is ending up because of Star Trek uh, Picard season three, right? And and listen, it's, a, it's remarkable that Paramount was as open as they were with all of that. They didn't just share all the story with us, but they did really open the door to Heather and we would pitch things and Heather would say, oh, well, be careful with this and, and let's maybe, maybe we can dovetail a little bit this way. So she was kind of a weather vane for us. She wouldn't give us all the plot details, but she would tell us what was happening. And then obviously now that the show's come out, we can really aim towards it. And it, and it, and it helps, you know, it, it helps us um, fill in the blanks as it were for a lot of these characters in this time period and track. So, I mean, obviously as a writer, we, we, we all writers have egos all writers want their story to be the big one to have their characters do the, the big saving because this is the big day of blood series and technically star trek's the flagship is there any kind of elements you're kind of like kind of want to hold back on like i want to make sure that's in my story not that you know that star trek because i want it to be you know the defiant moment you know our comic book moment i think that i mean it, we had little moments like that like where jackson and colin and i had to split this stuff up but we really did get together in the IDW offices for about a week and, and, and break this whole event as the alpha issue, which is day of blood, number one, mm. 30 pages that the three of us wrote together. And Ramon Rosanas came in and, and drew, he was the first artist in on, on the flagship book. But then we just wrote the story as it would. We knew we had four issues after that in each book, two in each book. And we broke it up by then. And we, we just wrote it as one big story. 
um, at least story beats. And then, and then just kind of put, you know, Defiant 6, Star Trek 11, Defiant 7, Star Trek 12 on there. So we knew where we were going to end. And what was really nice was the unifying factor in all of that was on hell because he drew the entire event after Ramon. Mm. So Ramon kind of kicks it off and then he turns it over to Angel and Angel drew all four issues of Day of Blood. So mm. he he was our unifying factor and he would he was the one kind of holding the football in that he knew everything that was happening in every book down to the the, the panels, right? And mm. obviously we're reading each other's work on the crossover and making sure it's all, you know, in the right place, but but yeah, you know, like I I get I get some juicy, you know, data lore scenes, you know, they they get some juicy Cisco wharf scenes, but I, I think it's, you know, we have enough cool stuff in our in our books that uh, you know, it, it felt okay to share. I mean, the one funny thing was we have one character that's in Day of Blood is Shax from Lower Decks. And it's, mm. you know, it's amazing that Paramount and Mike let us do this, but you know, we we handed off the kind of contained adventure that Shax experiences to Ryan North and Derek Charm. So if anybody was jealous of anybody, it was the rest of us with Ryan and Derek because he just got to write the funniest, craziest thing. And the animation is perfect. It's done in the lower deck style, which is, is amazing because in our books, Shaq shows up and he looks like a he looks different. He doesn't look it's not lower deck style. He looks like a person along with the rest of the the cast. Mm. And he's done in on house style and, and Ramon style. Um, but then we got we had to be true to the the lower decks of it all. And so Ryan and Derek went off and did, built this thing called Shax's Best Day. And that comes out at the end of the month. And it's wonderful. It's so great. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think one of the, the most interesting characters that you played with is Alexander. Because for the mm-hmm. most part, after Next Generation, I, I don't think he shows up in Deep Space Nine at all, does he? I don't recall him showing up. In, he in does. He like he flirts with like really getting hardcore into the Klingon Empire of it all, and he's like em- embracing his Klingonness, and he's very similar to Warp in that he's searching for his identity. He straddles multiple worlds, just like Warp did, but even more so, right? Because Kalar's mom and all of this stuff was already half human, so he's all over the place. You get the sense that he wasn't happy on Earth with the, his grandparents, the Rajenkos, right? He wasn't he wasn't happy on the Enterprise. Um, and then he's not really fitting in um, mm. among the, the the Klingon rank and file who see him as an other, right? And it's very similar to Worf. So he really is a person without a place. And that felt right to us for, man, let's have him fall into um, a persuasive yet very toxic, um, dangerous cult-like message, right? Uh, which is... It, run by a guy in a similar place, which is the clone of Kalos, the supposed founder of Klingon civilization, and yet some guy who has just grown in a laboratory. So all of his memories, all of his life history is not his own. Mm. So people project things onto him. People don't think he can live up to the the, the actuality of, of where he came from, all of those things. So it's a, a much louder um, trailhead in terms of identity that is the exact same thing that's been roiling in Alexander and Worf, you know, for mm. the entirety of his story as well. So it, the, these Klingon touch points, they can kind of connect in a way, right? And so Alexander falls prey to this. Worf is trying to get him out of this, but also understands better than most that Kalos and Alexander just don't, you know, fit in. And mm. and from that comes some really bad decisions, right? Um and choices and so he's he's trying to pull alexander out of this but he at the same time in order to do that he has to answer for some of the neglect you know and not being there for his son in ways that maybe he should have been so it's a real referendum on morph as a father and i'm glad we've gotten to tell that story because sometimes you know alexander is just gonna get parked in the enterprise and he gets referenced you know what i mean and and Warf's like oh yeah my son's here like it, it we kind of leaned into that story once right and, and so he has to answer to his adult son and be like Hey, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't always there for you in the ways I needed to be because you wrestle with a lot of the same things I have my entire life. Mm. And maybe that's another reason why I didn't address it or deal with you head on the way I should have. And so all of that comes out in day of blood. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about, um, with Alexander, um, and it's not interesting this part, but it, it kind of was kind of funny. Um, there's a meme that came out around Star Trek Picard season three 
where um, they had that scene where um, Warp Trilogy is like, I'm the son of blah, 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 blah. And, and they and they never mentions the father of Alexander. Like, he, he dumped that part out. And they're like, why the hell would he not say that? And it's kind of interesting when you read your part, you're like, oh, that's why he didn't say I am the father of Alexander. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and there's there's more to, there's even more to the story. And I, I, if you've read through Defiant 7, yeah, like it's, it's pretty wild what we've been able to do. But, you know, it doesn't end there. There's still more to come in the, the final day of Blood Peace. And then, and I will say that there's more to come with Alexander um, in the Star Trek line. And I, I think what we've ended up with is a really rich adult character that has all of these classic hallmarks of the mo- the best Star Trek characters, which is here's somebody kind of at sea in mm. the galaxy at large, um, straddling worlds, right? Spock is very much this, right? He's half human, he's half Vulcan, right? Is he accepted fully by Sarek? It's 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 all very it's all parallel with each other, you know. Like there there's Hugh, the individualized Borg. There's seven of nine. There's there's Ro Laren, who's a Starfleet elite officer who becomes, who's insubordinate, becomes a spy and then a defector and a rebel and all of it, you know, like the, people straddle worlds so well uh, in Star Trek. That's such a hallmark of the characters. And and it's, it's very rich in terms of how it exists in Alexander, the way he's been rendered. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that our book has gotten to carry that forward and fill it out more. Well, that's the thing about like Blana Torres. Um, she seems yeah, to have a, a, an interesting one, yeah. connection with Worf and Alexander being um, half human as well. So, I mean, is, is that some interactions we're going to see some more of? She, I mean, she's definitely someone who is, has a vocal perspective on what's going on on the Klingon homeworld and with the Red Path, right? And she is someone who, she has all of it wrapped up into one, right? Where she's half human, half Klingon. Uh, and she's also, like Ro, been involved in the Maquis separatist movement, right? Mm-hmm. But then is hailed as a hero aboard the USS Voyager, right? So... This is following up after Voyager's return, and she is lost again because the fanfare of the Voyager's return has died down, and some of the old guard of the of the Federation and Starfleet still see her as a Maquis traitor, right? They, they weren't there in the Delta Quadrant for all of that, so she's having trouble plugging herself in. So a lot of Baylana's interaction in my book, and an important dynamic for it, is her and Ro. Because Ro left Starfleet to join the Maquis, and Melana left the Maquis to rejoin Starfleet, right? And she did not experience the Maquis in the Delta Quadrant. She kind of was gone for a lot of the, the big pieces of the Maquis movement, especially its collapse. Ro was right there when everything went to hell. And so there's kind of a, a look of, an askance look between the two of them for a lot of my book that's continuing on into the arc even after... Mm. Um, defiant but for me or or after day of blood rather but for me a big thing to solve is what gets Ro from the Maquis back into Starfleet Mm. and for me and in my story what I've really landed on is Belana Torres is key to that switch Mm. and it's something that I'm still writing and still building out with Mike Fian and uh, and now Angel in arc four um, of my book, but we're we're working on that and really trying to tell a whole Ro Laren story, the one that really um, affects Belana as well and sets her up for what she's going to do. Now, one interesting thing that you mentioned is that you're saying there's so more you're going to do with Alexander, but in but in part four of uh, five of Day of Blood, his face seems pretty certain. So <laughs> I, I'm just asking, what that, is like, going on there's, here? There's some plot, like in the finale of. In the finale of uh, Day of Blood, which is coming out on the 27th in the flagship book, right? Star Trek 12. What's at play is some really fun. What's great about what's great about this line is that not only are we really embracing Trek, but we're embracing the comic book medium, right? There's things mm. that you can do in comics in terms of scope, um, in terms of uh, just kind of the the heightened reality of it all that we can really lean into, right? Like there's some things that happen with Cisco because he's the emissary of the prophets and he's come out of the wormhole that seem almost superhuman. Another thing at play in Day of Blood are these orbs, the Bajoran orbs, right? We mm. have the orb of destruction, which is in Kales's possession. And we have the orb of creation, which is in Cisco and the, the rest of the heroes possession, right? And so there are there are two sides to that coin. And there's some really interesting stuff that happens in the finale that even touches, it touches on, I will say, um, 
the Genesis project uh, that touches on things that uh, they've been they've been doing in Star Trek Echoes, which is the motion picture book um, that's out right now that that takes place where where they they encounter some things in that book, which is almost a hundred years ago at that point, that Spock will remember mm. and he'll be reminded of in the finale of uh, Day of Blood and all of that comes into play and just all of the fun kind of halcyon things that you get to do in comic books all the time uh so well, so it, we'll... It, it'll, it'll, i think it, it's satisfactory it's very comic book but in a good way and it's very star trek in the way that star trek has always played with life and death you know uh creation and destruction and all of these themes that are at play and all of the best science fiction stories of the of the universe well, I think the interesting thing too about the Orb of Destruction, because once again, it's the prophets. The prophets of the fans of Deep Space Nine know they're they've always been shown to kind of um, either be a, aloof or indifferent, or these like good benevolent creatures. What does it say about them that they have an orb called the Orb of Destruction? Right, exactly, and I think that that's a kind of central tenet of the whole story in both books leading up to this, because in the in the Star Trek book, it's really that Kaelas is trying to kill the gods of the universe, all of the most right. powerful beings there are. And he's, I think, legitimately questioning the motives of these gods. And I think that is that these esoteric motives or sometimes even selfish motives of some of them, whether they be Q or the prophets or, you know, things like this, they're they're very much interested in their own survival and perpetuation, just like we are. And I think that that is, uh, that is true with the prophets. And I think that the, the main flagship title, Star Trek, is going to continue to dig into the prophets, even after Day of Blood, with Cisco. And there's going to be a real kind of closer examination of what's going on with them, what are they up to, um, what is the context of us versus them in the universe and in the galaxy? So I think all of that is all of that is going to come into play. But yeah, I think, you know, there's for every prophet, there's a pa race, right? There's these kind of dualities that exist in track is is really important. Well, and kind of something we touch upon when you, when you think about Kalos and his goal to kill the gods. He's not necessarily wrong, is he? Because when you think, think about the track record of the gods of the in Star Trek, the Q continuum. Not good people. Gary Mitchell mm -hmm. didn't do so well himself. Mm -hmm. um, there's, if you watch the original series, there's multiple other times where gods have been introduced. The one that was supposed to be, I think, um, was it Hermes or I can't remember the one where he's like the the Greek god episode. Yeah. He wasn't such a yeah. cool guy, good guy either. They they don't really have the best track record of being good, positive beings in the Star Trek universe. Is Kalis necessarily wrong? And what? or the repercussions of protecting these entities that are just going to turn around and probably do horrible things later. Well, I think that's true. I think, I think Kales is someone who is calling attention to their motives. And I think that's going to stick around with the characters even after day of blood. Right. Mm. And I think that they're going to be looking at all of these gods, especially the prophets, you know, in Cisco's perspective and wonder what's actually going on. You know, mm. what is the ultimate end goal here? Um, that said, I think Kaelas, more than anything, is a real hypocrite in that he's saying we're going to kill all the gods and destroy them, and it'll be this kind of radical democratization. But what's really happening is this kind of fascist rise to power of a guy who fancies himself a demigod, or, you know, which belies an insecurity that he is really just a clone of one, right? Mm. And so he is trying to ascend, in a way, by kind of taking out the competition. Mm. And so it's it's more, <laughs> it's Stalinism as opposed to communism, right? He's, <laughs> he's like, we must overthrow these evil capitalist structures so that I can be in charge and kill anyone who disagrees with me. Right. That's very chaos, right? Like, especially in our books. Yeah. So, I mean, once they and Day of Blood was again the big event. Once this is over, you're going to have a challenge on your hand on how do you top the first big event where you're literally having a character kill gods. You're introducing, you basically played with a lot of, of the Star Trek toys in the series already. Mm -hmm. How do you go anywhere from here that will not be anticlimactic from where you? just came from i think that you know it, it resets the the board for us um you know uh in terms of both books 
There's some mini series that will spin out of this too. I think what's what I had a lot of fun doing is, you know, my first arc was the five issues up to Day of Blood. My second arc was Day of Blood uh, as an event series, right? And so I just, I, I, I finished writing the third arc, which is what happens to Worf and his Defiant crew, this crew of renegades who kind of technically stole the Defiant. Now that they've done this great, big, huge, heroic act, how are they going to be received by Starfleet and the Federation for what they did and how they went about it, right? Mm. And so I hesitate to say back to basics because they're really carrying all of the weight emotionally of what they've been through together. But what's fun, I think, and I, I did a shorter arc with Mike Fian, who did our prelude to Day of Blood uh, story in uh, Free Comic Book Day's issue. Um, is that Starfleet says, hey, you really, you pulled something off and you broke a lot of rules and you did a lot of dirty work to get there. And that that ended up working out. And whereas Worf and the others, maybe even Roe are, are creeping up towards, maybe we should, maybe we should rejoin Starfleet. Starfleet might have other designs and say, mm. actually, we like the way you did this over here in the shadows. And, you know, by breaking a lot of our, rules and dictums and and maybe you guys can remain invisible for a little while and uh, continue to mop up some messes that mm. we're concerned about in the galaxy that we can't directly be involved in so Worf in the third act with the defiant crew is going to find himself being this kind of um, tool of starfleet that is disavowed for lack of a better word mm. right and now they're being made to be uh, fringe outsiders and 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 on and you know not allowed to wear uniforms and refused ranks so that they can do the stuff that Starfleet and the Federation would otherwise get in trouble for doing, mm -hmm. right? And so now they're going to find themselves in a real ethical quandary, and it's going to turn towards that. And then I think that that sets up, you know, they're, they're given a list of fugitives that they have to hunt. And we talked about this at San Diego Comic-Con, but it's like, they're going to have to, they're going, they have to go get these persons of interest for Starfleet. So they're going to have to go after Hugh and find Hugh. That's another person who's missing a second act between Next Generation and Picard, mm. right? So we get to tell Hugh's second act. Um, you know, we get to go after Burling off Rasmussen, which is a fun character, right? The Matt Frewer kind of time-traveling con man. And then, you know, still some other really intense folks, you know, there's an I ocean that they have to go after one of the, you know, gangster race people from the original series, um, who's been doing some really serious stuff. And and there's even more it's insidious villainy at play within his character that they're going to encounter. So it's really, it's really the defiant crew, like after the day of blood, uh, looking at themselves in the mirror and going, what are, what's our purpose? Mm. Where do we want to stand in the galaxy and in the order of things? And all of the characters are doing that on an individual level. Um, Spock is, is is still there and he's wrestling internally with a lot of things. A lot of things that actually will tie to uh, the very beginnings of where we see him at the beginning of the Kelvin timeline. Mm. Some of that is starting with Spock. And so Defiant is going to continue its tone of um, kind of counter and and you know, subversive and all of these things, but the characters are going to be really mired in that and find the, the darker side of that. And then that sets up arc four, which I'm writing right now, and Angel is back drawing. And that that is a full horror arc over five issues that I'm really excited about. And it picks up a major loose thread from Next Generation that started and then they abandoned. Mm. And we get to pick that up and kind of complete that story and so it really is just identifying these little pieces like that while while keeping it all thematically tied together through through the entire run of the book that's that's the idea and eventually at some point next year probably late in 2024 the books will come back together again and we'll do another event that i think will it'll be hard to top day of blood in terms of scope and meaning but i think we'll i think we'll have some really fun stuff to do in the event we're planning now is star trek going to potentially spin off to a third main major series um 
in terms of a major series, I don't know yet. Like the line is still just growing, but there there are a couple mini series that are going to come out, and it's really more just experimental testing ground to see how far we can take these stories, um, how much we can maintain reader interest, and mm. all of that stuff. But uh, yeah, the idea is to kind of grow an ecosystem of books. I don't think there'll ever be like ten books running. Like Star Wars, Star Wars is very different. Um, the appetite is different for Star Wars. You know, I think people often look at Trek and they think that there's like a high bench mark to, to get into it. Mm. But the, the truth of the matter is like, um, you know, it, it it's expansive. I mean, you, mm. you could go in all these different directions and and the the fans and the readers we do have are ardently with us for everything. I mean, they're, put, they're putting both books and the minis and the one shots and the annuals on their pull lists and they're picking up all of it because if you read the whole thing, what we're trying to do is just have it be, it's all the more of an enriching experience. You know, you can just read Defiant, you can just read Trek, you could just pick up one of these mini series, but they all are going to touch each other in a way. And we're really trying to be smart about that so that anybody who's in it for the long haul, um, they're getting really immersed in, in all of this stuff. So we want to take it as far as we can, to be honest. Well, like I said, I really do look forward to what you're doing because David Blood, Day of Blood has been awesome and I really Thank appreciate you. it. And like you said, the more fact that you're leaning more into the Deep Space Nine characters in both series is is, is a bonus for anyone who actually loves Deep Space Nine. So yes. it's been fantastic, Mr. Cantwell. It's been an absolute honor to talk with you, sir. And I look forward to talking with you again for, about your the next major storyline. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You too.